Welcome back to the Manifest Your Success podcast, where we break down what it means to be successful, share the accomplishments, failures, and perspectives of individuals on entrepreneurship, business, and self-improvement. All right. In this episode, we are joined by Ken Coppell. Ken is the former creative... Coppell. Ken is the former creative director of a New York ad agency and the founder and sole proprietor of Coppell Communications, a writing, marketing, and creative services agency. He has worked with companies like Warner Bros., Taco Bell, Vogue, Marriott, and many others. Welcome to the show, Ken. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yes, sir. It's a pleasure having you on. Um, so I'm actually curious. Uh, artists and, and writing is kind of a fascinating thing that I don't really know many people that actually just write for fun. And I, when I looked at your experience and your resume, it was kind of, it was really in-depth and you started um, years ago. So what kind of got you into like artistry and writing and like what made you so attracted to just like creating things and r- drawing them or on computers if, if that was the case too? Okay, well, it was before computers, so there's a hint. <laughs> um, the, I've been doing it since the beginning. I joke that I was probably drawing pictures on the side of the womb. Um, I have the curse of the creative person. If you're a creative person, no one tells you to go create things. Nobody gives you an assignment. You just do it. It's like a disease. It's You just start making stuff. So I've been drawing and writing and taking pictures and doing all that stuff since forever. And um, if you meet any of these people, you guys are in college, you know any of those creative people, they're just doing it. They have to do it. Now, of course, segueing from that to a career, that's that's a different challenge. As I'm fond of saying, creative professional is an oxymoron. <laughs> when, um, when you were young and kind of getting into different creative like avenues, I guess, were you ever interested in, you know, maybe turning those into almost like a freelance thing or anything like that? Or were you just purely doing it out of enjoyment? I mean, initially it was just out of enjoyment. Um, but the, I got hints early on (laughs) that every now and then something would pop up. It's like, Oh, there's kind of a demand for this or, oh, somebody might pay for this. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, and I was thinking back, you know, you guys are in college. God bless you. That's awesome. I was in college. It was a thousand years ago. But I was thinking back to when I was your age and, and a lot of these things that you're asking about happened at that time. When I was in high school, I was always drawing the teacher, secretly drawing the teacher. And uh, it would get me in trouble most of the time. And um, one time I got caught. It was a student teacher and he caught me and he found the picture and he offered to buy it. And that was an aha moment. Okay. And then, so I ended up during my college years in the summer, I worked in a, uh, ended up working in a portrait shop on the boardwalk in Atlantic city was a touristy place. And I would do quick sketches in charcoal and pastel. This is back before iPhones. <laughs> you couldn't get a picture quickly. You know, you have to go to Photomat and wait a week unless you had a Polaroid camera and make you a little terrible picture that, you know. So, and this is where I'd share the screen. So, like, for example, here's a pencil sketch, um, which you can see if you're seeing that. Wow. How old were you when you Can you see this? that picture? Yes. Yeah. This one I did probably college age. Uh, but there's a buddy of mine. We were just sitting in a restaurant. I said, hey, Joe, Joe, hold still. I have my sketchbook. I just did that in pencil. So, um, so that kind of stuff. Um, so you know, it's like, Hey, I can make, make money at that. And then another thing that popped up just after I graduated college. And I think this is, this is a story that you guys will appreciate. Um, I was fresh out of college. I was starving and, um, I wanted to get a new car, not brand new, but you know, a car for me, I was driving a, ha- a hand me down station wagon. I'm like 21, 22. It's like, no girl's going to look at me in a hand me down station wagon. I want to get a nice little sports car. So I go apply for a, go to the bank, apply for a car loan, and I'm promptly turned down. Go to another bank, apply for a loan, turn down. Go to a car lot, say, oh, Mr. Copeland, yeah, here, buy the car. Let's just put in your application for credit. And I'm just rejected everywhere. I have no credit. And so I go to another bank, and I say, yeah, I'd like to apply for a car loan. They say, here you go, Mr. Copeland, fill out this form. And I said, wait. I said, you're going to reject me. If I just fill out this form, I know you're going to reject me. I've been rejected a lot already. But I think I'd be a viable risk. I think I'd be pretty good risk for you folks. And uh, and you could make a profit off the interest you charge me. I said, is there anything that I can do? And I'm in this little bank, branch bank, uh, bank branch. And they handed me a legal pad and a pencil. 
And they said, well, you can write a note and attach it to your application. There's a table. I said, okay. And I sat down and I put my new, newly minted English degree to use. And I wrote the best damn note I've written in my <laughs> life. Okay. I put out the logical reasons why I should do this. I'm a good credit risk. You can talk to my accountant. I show up for work on time. And then, and then I ended on the emotional appeal. You know, I know that you reading this one back in, when you were young, you didn't have credit either. And you were, in, you know, can you put yourself in my shoes and do this? Stuff? So I wrote this thing just off the top of my head. I'm waiting. I don't hear anything. A couple of days later, I call the bank. Hi, I'm checking on my thing. Uh, what's your name? Kenneth Copel. I said, Oh, Mr. Copel. Yeah, said, oh, everybody's reading your note. Okay. Goodbye. A couple of days later, I get a call from the bank. Mr. Copel, come down, pick up your check. And I had a car. So that was another aha moment. It's like, all I had was the pencil and the paper. That's what made the difference between everybody else and me going into debt. <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, there's two sides to it. It's like, yeah, wow, well, hey, you know, I, I, got, I got credit. And that was, that's what established the credit that I have today. I mean, that's where it started from that. And then the last thing that comes to mind when you say, you know, did things pop up? And they, and they kind of did. My, one of my very first jobs out of college, I worked for a local newspaper. And I was writing like little blurbs about local stores and stuff like that. And um, I would go and interview them for like a Christmas catalog that they would publish. And I would ask them a lot of questions and take pictures and do all this stuff. And a lot of these clients of the newspaper, when I was done, I was about to leave. They say, hey, Ken, uh, can we talk? And they wanted to like hire me to do something on the side. Hey, we wanted to do a little ad. Could you, you think you could write that or draw that or whatever? And um I mean, even when I was in college, I was, uh, I designed this, uh, had this artwork that I drew and I wanted to get t-shirts printed. It's kind of shortened this story. And there was a local company that made t-shirts. And I said, you know, what would these cost? And I didn't have any money. It's like, I'd love to get these t-shirts made. And the, guy, the owner of the company is like, well, you know, these were, did you draw these? Said, yeah, I did. And he said, well, you know, can we talk? <laughs> and next thing I knew, I had cartons of t-shirts and it was kind of a barter deal. So there were, you know, starting out young, it was barter. Gosh, another one just came to mind. I, I worked for a bicycle shop when I was fresh out of college. I needed a bicycle and they needed a logo and a stationary package. And uh, my logo and stationary package that I designed happened to cost about the same exempt amount as one of their nice bicycles. And I got a bike out of the deal. So those are some of the early successes. All of these were when I was around 18 through 21, right around that slot. So, you know, you get these bits of feedback and then they're fueled by hunger. You know, I was hungry, I wanted to eat, I still do. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's go away. I think that's fascinating. Don't go away. Don't go away. <laughs> you really took took like your skill and you knew that you had this valuable skill that you could bring to other people and you literally started doing it and applied it to every single person that you came across of. And like I, I think I think there's something powerful in like staying true to like what your passions are and what you're good at. And if you can really figure out a way to like take those passions and those strengths of you as a person and go and help other people with them, I think that takes you a lot further in life than trying to be someone that you're not. And you clearly knew that you were good um, at the skill that you had and you applied it to other people in life. So I think that's just a fascinating thing to note, just listening to all those stories. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, not necessarily about my talent, but definitely about uh, staying true to yourself. You know, it's funny. I was joking with my son just before this. I said, I'm going to be on a podcast. He said, what's it called? This it's called Manifest Your Success. If really, I see after interviewing me, it's going to be a really short episode. Um, but if you <laughs> stay true to yourself, um, yeah, then you will, you will succeed. Uh, I mean, you will have options in terms of there's, everybody's got different skill sets. You kind of weigh them out. It's like, well, which ones? I like doing A, B, and C. Which one pays the most? Right? you got to be pragmatic at a certain point. Um, you know, I, you know. How much can you write poetry? You know. Then again, I've written lots of jingle lyrics, which is the same thing. Um, but the converse is true, and that's really what I want to pounce on and make clear to you guys. And then, and, and Kyle, you seem to be all over it. Is that if you try and shoehorn yourself into something, you will not be happy, and you will not succeed. You will not succeed. My favorite line from the movie Citizen Kane. You guys ever seen that one? I have not. Probably out of our day. <laughs> yeah. it's a, People say it's the greatest movie ever made. It, it's good. I like it. Watch it. It's fun. But there's a line in there where they interview this guy and they, uh, 
they talk about this guy Kane, and he was a multi multi millionaire. He was pat patterned after William Randolph Hearst. And the interviewer says, "Well, he sure made a lot of money." The other guy said, "You know, it's no big trick to make a lot of money. If all you want is to make a lot of money." I love that line. <laughs> love that line. That's that's a great line. I, a, I'm a big fan of yeah, movies, and I think there's a lot. Of, yeah, Sam a Sam's probably even more of a big fan of movies. I feel like you can learn so much from them. Um, I wanted to touch on something. I don't know if this is really going to relate. So if it's a dead end, then this, I'll take the blame for it. But um, I know there's this in psychology, like, and just in human development in general, um, when you're like, people say that before you turn 25 and you try to pick up a musical instrument, um, it's a lot easier when you're a kid. And because your brain, your brain is still developing. And the more you practice something when you're younger, the the better it carries on into the rest of your life. And that goes, same with language, same with music. And I'm curious, um, since you were a creative writer, did you notice like a difference when you were young? And did you notice like more of like an abstract, um, your abstract imagination? Was it different when you were younger compared to what you're doing now today? Or like, how do you think that has changed over time? That's a great question. And it's certainly not a cul-de-sac. Um, that's really interesting. No one's ever asked me that. And I've never been uh, put on the spot to think about it. But it's I can I can give you a somewhat cogent answer. Um, the short answer is yes, I have changed. Um, <laughs> in fact, we were talking about Rick, the, my Rick Brandt books. Okay, I don't know if that was in the in the uh, before we started recording, but I'm a fan of these these books that were written in the 1940s about a boy who solves mysteries through science and electronics of, of the 1940s, and um, I read those as a kid, even though. <laughs> It's kind of weird of me to read them as a kid because they were decades out of print. Um, but the stuff that I was reading, it influenced my style. I was, if there was something I read and I liked, I was writing like that. It just rubbed off on me. I was kind of a sponge and I hadn't developed my own style. You, you, you don't come out of the womb with your own style. You, you pick up other influences. And the same thing with my drawing and, and art, composition, all kinds of stuff. I've, I've worn a lot of hats. Um, so it's definitely, uh, it, it was more nebulous, more malleable. When I was younger, I was still exploring. I was much more easily influenced, which is funny because like, it seems like, oh, that was awful. I was writing like somebody else. Like, no, you got to try it before you see what parts of it work for you and don't and see if you can do it. If you take an art class, one of the first things, almost any drawing class, what are they going to do? They're going to send you to a museum with a sketchbook and copy the old masters. Right? You ever go to a museum and you always see some art student there trying to copy a Rembrandt? There's a reason for that. You know, it's like, oh, see what they did. Learn that. Learn from the best. And then once you get going, then you fi figure out your own path. Um, I'm a huge fan of breaking the rules creatively. But what are the rules of grammar? What are the rules of English? If you know them inside out, really know them, then you can break them creatively. If you don't know them, you break them, you look like an idiot. But if you can break them creatively, that's pretty cool. And that's where you're starting to push the art, for example, in writing. Um, as far as picking up instruments, languages, stuff like that, when you're younger, accents, you know, little kids can learn a second language and they have a flawless accent. Um, yeah, I'm an old dog. So that's that would be a tough new trick for me. I admit it. Um, that said, I do try and do my brain ups, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of crossword puzzles, for example. They keep you kind of limber, build your vocabulary. I just think they're fun. Um, I'm, I'm a bird nerd, so I like going out and looking at the birds and learning stuff. That, that That's a turkey vulture right there. That's what that is. Turkey vulture shrine. Um, my family knows I'm into turkey vultures, so they give me <laughs> stuffed turkey vultures, pictures of turkey vultures, books about turkey vultures. So, yeah, so you can, you can keep growing. I mean... I've heard this, I'm sure you've heard it, is that the brain is, is very, very similar to the, the muscles in your body. You got to keep it exercised. You got to, you know, give it tone and resilience. And uh, so I'm in the phase of my life where I'm trying to put that to the test. <laughs> <laughs> you um you mentioned kind of copying the old masters and, and then making your own path. That kind of reminded me of like mentorship. And I think it's, it's something we talk about a lot on the podcast is how important it is for people to like find a mentor or someone to look up to and um, like get advice from when they're young and they're still figuring things out. I'm curious, did you ever have a mentor in your younger years before you ended up starting your own company? Wow. That's a good question. Um, 
boy, whatever I answer, I'm gonna I'm gonna think of it. I'm gonna lie awake tonight and regret it and say, oh, I forgot this person. I forgot this person. I'm Sorry. such an idiot. Yeah, we're throwing a curveball um, at you with this. question. No, that's here. <laughs> okay. It's a great question. I, that's nothing against you. That's on me. Um, it depends on which hat uh, I've had. Gosh, I've had a lot of people in my life that that have directly or indirectly. I mean, when I worked at the sket the portrait shop. Okay, on the boardwalk. I was 18 when I started there. And um, there was a guy there who, his name was Bob, and he was in his 60s, and we all called him the old master. And he was amazing. It's just like, why do I even pick up a pencil? Why do I, why do I even get up in the morning? This guy was just so good. And, but I would watch, and he was a nice guy. And he knew that I was just like, look over his shoulder and just watch and watch. And to this day, if you ask me to do a portrait, you know, if I'm looking at you and I'm starting to measure and, and, and block it out and everything like that, I'm using tricks that I picked up from him. It's not like he sat down and said, Ken, do it this way. I just saw that he made choices and then I would try them. It's like, that one works for me. And just to give you an idea how, how counterintuitive it was, and this is just one example, this one person in this one thing a zillion years ago, but when he would do a portrait, and I don't do this exactly, and again, I don't, I don't draw much anymore. Um, I don't really need to. Um, but somebody would sit for him. He's at his easel. He takes his pencil, and he just draws a dark circle. It's like, what is that? That was their right pupil. And he would work his way out from there. Right? And it's like, they never... No art class will ever teach you that. Do block this, do the top of the lines, do this rough thing. And it worked for him. And one day I was like, dare I try this? And I tried it. It's like, oh, I get what he's doing. He's not starting macro. He's starting micro. He's not using a yardstick. He's taking an inch and using the eye as a very precise measuring gauge to get the rest of the face. He's working outward. He's totally flaunting tradition and blowing it away. And he's amazing. And so, I mean, was he directly mentoring me? Not really, but um, so anyway, there's, you know, it, it is kind of is where you, where you find it. Um, you know, I, um, so anyway, that's. Yeah. Do you think, do you think you would have been in the same, like, do you think you would have been the man you are today, not man in general, but like the career you've had today without those mentors that kind of pushed you in the right direction. And how important do you think it is for people that are young to really go out and chase a mentorship in their life, whether it be for artistry or for like lawn mowing or whatnot? How important is it to you, do you think? Uh, well, yeah, the people who, who, you know, who have been along my journey have definitely shaped it. So I'm absolutely a product of those experiences and those people. Uh, not all of them were good, okay? And you learn from the bad ones at least as much as you do from the good ones. And I got good advice from my father, my A1 mentor, um, when I was around your age. And, uh, and you know, I, got, I was working summer jobs. You know, so I was a dishwasher in a restaurant before I was able to sketch the portraits. And I was a camp counselor. And I was, I, I bought a printing press. And that was my first business. I had a printing press in my basement and I was printing up business cards and stationery and stuff like that. And he told me, he said, when you're young, get as many different jobs as you can. Get lots of different jobs. Get a feel for all different things. I was an usher in a movie theater. I, I did all kinds of stuff. And um, I think that was great advice because if I just found one thing and said, I want to do this, I'm just doing this, I would, I would have had tunnel vision, you know? So... I think that's really good advice and and now's the time to do it you know when you when you're young right now i can't do it i got a wife and kids and mortgage like oh i'm going to be a free spirit i'm going to try something really hard to pull it off when you're young and you're single you can experiment your overhead's limited you know you can you can get away with this stuff go for it so um that's that's what i would say so in terms of mentorship you know formal mentorship I mean, I've had, when I was at the ad agency in New York, I had interns, for example, and they would report to me and I would write the recommendation letters and all this stuff. So like, maybe that, that counts as my paying it forward. Um, but yeah, I would say try and just get a lot of, lot of different experiences. That's great advice I got from my dad. 
Yeah, I think that is great advice. And you kind of mentioned how you've also um, had, you also came across like bad mentors or bad experiences, maybe not mentors. Um, like, how do you kind of, how do you, when you run into a situation like that, that ends up like being harmful or just, just not all around beneficial, like how do you tackle that and move forward that you found, would you say? That I found, yeah, everybody's answer to this is going to be different. And uh, my answer is different contextually depending on which, situ- which bad situation I've been through. I have a buddy of mine. He's one of the smartest people I know. And people, he tells me, people always ask him, how are you so successful? How are you so smart? And his answer, and he's not joking, is I have screwed up more things in more ways than anybody I've met. And so each one you know, is a learning, uh, learning teachable moment. Um, it depends. I mean, at this point in my life and in my career, by virtue of all the experience I have, there's a lot less stress for me. When I'm approached, for example, by a prospective client, my biggest thing now is, is it a good fit? Like they'll ask me, oh, can you do this? Can you do this? Like, yeah, of course I can do it. You know, can you write this? Can you do creative concepts for this? Can you do a video script, write a website, PowerPoint deck, case study, blog, blah, blah, blah. Any of, that. of course I can do them, right? Do them, you know, and I can hit them out of the park. But is it a good fit? Is this somebody I want to work with? You know, are they going to benefit from this? Am I going to be happy? Are they going to be happy? And the idea of just being able to nip it in the bud and say, I don't think it's a good fit. There's enough work in the world, thanks, and pass. And that's something that I've only been able to do very late in my life and career. Um, I wish I could have done it earlier. I'm not sure if I could have done it earlier. When I was younger, I suffered through some bad stuff. Um, I'm not going to name any names or specific companies or anything like that, but there's been times where it's like, man, and the motivation was to get the heck out of there. Okay. So the motivation of, you know, how did you get that new job? Cause I hated the old job. So that's a motivator. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's funny. You see the ads on TV for like LinkedIn jobs or a career builder and, and they always show the young woman. And I'm so happy I got my new job. They never say, or like, I'm out of this damn place. Good riddance. See you later, suckers. You know? And that's an unfortunate reality. That's the flip side of it. You yeah. know, you don't, if you're happy in some place, you don't leave. You stay there. That's funny. That's funny. Simple. You mentioned that uh, at LinkedIn. Um, there's like, I don't know if you're, if you're uh, active on Twitter, but there was a video going around of, of some girl who worked at LinkedIn and she basically did like this little vlog, like day in the life of working at LinkedIn. And it was, like it was the biggest joke because like she did absolutely like no work and like she would get to work and there'd be all these breakfasts prepared for her. She'd have a hot towel in the morning and she would like just answer emails for like 30 minutes and she'd go out and like walk around the city and like go and get a group lunch. And then she got like a face mask treatment, like all, all of this under business time being paid like a day at work and like everyone just clowned on her because of how easy it was. I mean, obviously th- this was kind of a more recent thing because a lot of our work environment has transferred ever since the pandemic and COVID came around. It kind of threw everyone out of spiral, but that was funny. You just brought that up and I just, I just wanted to mention it in case you haven't um, seen that before. <laughs> I haven't seen that. And given all the tech layoffs that have been in the news as we record this, I wonder if she still has that cushy job. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually mentioning Twitter again, someone was like all the, all the uh, young colleagues that, that have been posting videos of their day in the life work are, are number one on the chopping block for people that are getting laid off. <laughs> um, but transitioning here, uh, finally into Copel communications, um, something, Copel. Oh, Copal Communications. I'm sorry Copal about that. Communications. No Copal Communications. Um, no problem. So Cop- Copal Communications, you started this over 28 years ago. And it's kind of interesting because so much has changed, I think, over the digital age. Um, and technology nowadays is way bigger than it was, I'm sure, 28 years ago. So w- when did you realize, like, you wanted to start this business? And, like, how, how was the, um, the digital marketing space? If it wasn't, maybe it wasn't digital marketing. Maybe it was print as, as you have on your website. How was, how was that different than it is now um, when you first started? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I, as I mentioned, I was with the uh, ad agency in New York. There five, I was creative director. I was there five and a half years. Um, I did have another gig after that. I worked at a TV post-production studio as a producer and paint box artist. Um, and then I struck out on my own. And this is around 95. It's a really long time ago. Um, so some things are totally different, right? Zoom. Even the internet, okay, my gosh. Um, but some things are exactly the same. When I was at the ad agency, for example, I was creative director, so I was doing print, radio, television, and outdoor 
and a little bit of PR, for example. And they still exist, print radio, and well, print, not that much. But, you know, so now there's a lot of what I do is on the web. Okay, that didn't exist. That's new. But creative services are still creative services. They're identical. Writing good copy is still writing good copy. It doesn't matter if you're if you're putting it up on a website or you're putting it in a print advertisement or you're tr- carving it in cuneiform. It's the same thing. And then for me, what I, since the bulk of what I do these days is writing, I was, I believe, pretty fortunate from a technological standpoint when I struck out on my own um, because my stock and trade is basically Word docs, right? A Word doc. So when there was dial up internet, I could send that to somebody. They're tiny. They're little files. Couldn't do it with a photograph, and let alone you know a video or something like that. And so I was establishing clients all over the place, and a lot of them I'd never met, didn't know what they looked like, um, just doing and working from home, working like this with my turkey vulture. And um, so people said, like when the pandemic struck, Ken, how did that affect you? Working from home, deal with people remotely. I've been doing this for decades. The rest of the world just caught up to me because of the virus. Um, so it hasn't changed. And and the way to encapsulate it was once I had a big client and I was looking to move. My wife and I were considering moving, making a big move across the country. And I was really concerned about this client who was near me at the time. And I asked him, I said, you know, I'm considering moving. Would you mind? And this is through email. And he said, and he wrote back and he said, Ken, he said, you could live, you could live on the moon. And I wouldn't care as long as you had internet access. And I turned to my wife and said, yeah, we can go. And um, and that was kind of the launching off. That was like the official blessing that I got at the time. Yeah, that's awesome. I think um, especially with something in, in that industry or in any in industry, really, there's always a lot of competition um, with something that where the demand is so high because, you know, everyone needs something written or everyone needs something um, produced. So maybe there's a lot, you have a lot of other people that are also trying to grab up those clients. When you first started in maybe your early years, was it something where you really had to like push your brand out there, push your name to get clients or were some of your past work or past clients really working for you and helping you um, get your name out there and gain more clients? A little both. Great question. Uh, Yeah. When I went out on my own, there were a lot of uh, different businesses that um, that I knew through my ad agency days from different vendors, TV studios, whatever, other ad agencies. And they would call me and say, hey, Ken, can you do a little job? And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. So there was that. But I did have to push myself out. And I got a funny story about that I think you guys will enjoy. Um, there used to be a publication, now it's online, called Ad Week. Trade pub, about the ad biz. And, uh, but it was in print at the time. And when I struck out on my own, it's like, well, I should get my name out there as, as a writer, for example. And um, they used to have classifieds in the back, like little listings. You know, you pay by the word. So all these little listings in the back, classified ads don't even exist anymore. And uh, so I looked and I was like, I should put up an ad for me as a copywriter. So I bought a copy of Ad Week and I flipped to the back and I looked at, you know, by categories, photographers, musicians, copywriters. And I look at all the listings and they all are the same, pretty much. Guy says, I am a brilliant copywriter. I have won lots of awards. Hire me. And the next one says, I am I am truly funny. If you need humor, I am very humorous. The next one says, I am extra creative. I, you know, if you need creative work, I am the most creative person. And it's like one of these turn to the camera, like, can you believe this? The universe has handed me an opportunity. So I take out an ad in ad week. And it says in bold, it says bad copy. And then underneath it said overpriced too. I had my name and my phone number. That was the whole ad. That's how I got Taco Bell. That's how I got Bijan Fragrances. I got a number of ad agencies off of that. And importantly, I got my first consulting client off of that. There was a, a former Harvard Business School professor who was consulting. And somebody on his team said, wow, the deliverables are great, but they're kind of make your eyes glaze over. They read like they're too academic. Maybe we should get a copywriter. And he saw that ad. And from that point, that's when my practice bifurcated. To this day, I serve two broad constituencies, the first being what I call my creatives, the ad agency and stuff, and they still kind of find me. I don't solicit them all that much. And the others are those consultants because it kind of pushes my nerd button. I really enjoy working on that stuff and learning all these cool things. And um, 
but anyway, yeah, that was that started it. That was it. And then, you know, to this day, I still have to push push out. I'm on this podcast. <laughs> you millions of viewers and listeners out there. <laughs> yeah, you know that's so, right. That was a low ball, man. Why'd than, you low boss like doesn't, that? Doesn't. <laughs> doesn't get any bigger than manifest your success. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, that's an awesome podcast, Spotify or wherever you download fine podcasts. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful right there. Creative talking. Um, if I do say so myself, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I'm curious. So like you said that you, you created these, you have these two groups of consultants and then creatives. So when you first started, um, was it just like yourself and you were just kind of pushing out, like you, you, you targeted this ad and you gained a lot of growth out of it. But when did you finally realize like, okay, maybe I do need to take a step back and kind of do more facilitating of the business instead of actually doing the handwork myself. And how did that process carry out where you developed these consultant sides and the creative sides? Like, what was that thought process like? It just happened organically in terms of the work that came in. I mean, I'm still basically a solopreneur. It's not like I, I, I'm very incredibly efficient. Um, I'm all about process improvement. And a lot of my clients are too. So I get a lot of it through osmosis uh, in terms of just best practice and and plus, I'm, I'm a creative person, so I'm looking at creative ways to solve my own problems and keep them efficient. How can just, you know, in terms of my workflow, in terms of billing, in terms of working on my Mac and doing stuff like, like I use color, for example, okay, because reading's hard. So I'll put stuff and I'll put it in different colors. Oh, that stuff's red. Okay, that stuff's blue. Okay. Oh, it's an invoice. I'll mark it green because that's the color of money it was paid, you know. So I'll do a lot of simple visual stuff like that. And then in terms of, that second group of clients, the, the consultants, um, it just, it was a matter of learning those other businesses. And uh, I've worked in, in so many different industries now on my client's behalf. They're the real superstars. Um, if you go to my website, cobalcommunications.com, uh, I'm sure you'll have a link in the show notes, right? Yes. Um, but you'll see uh, that I can't, um, I can't, I'm under NDA for a lot of that stuff. I've worked on all kinds of different stuff. I mean, I've worked on top secret programs for some, you know, where the end client would be some of the three letter agencies, for example, in the government. And I can't talk about that, but I'd have to learn this stuff really fast and get up to speed and be able to basically ghost write in the voice of someone who's smarter than me. And that's kind of a trick of what I do. And that's what I said about my website. If you look at the website, it says the secret weapon, Global Communications, the secret weapon of ad agencies and consultancies, because a lot of these people don't know I exist. I did a lot of writing for uh, Lockheed Martin. You know who they are. Tons and tons of deliverables for a, a consulting client of mine. You think Lockheed Martin knows I exist? They don't know I exist. But that consultant was able to get a lot of good follow on business because the deliverables were sharp. Yeah, that's that's awesome that you um, kind of worked worked on things for Lockheed Martin. Um, I think you kind of mentioned how you're incredibly efficient, and you you mentioned um, kind of how you color coordinate tasks. Are there any other like strategies that you've kind of picked up over the years that have really helped you um, hone your efficiency and maybe your productivity with so many different clients and things to handle at once? Yeah, uh, I'm on a Mac. And I'm, I'm, I'm very Mac fluent and uh, I'm good at it. So it, I, I'm able to get the, that operating system to work for me really well. So I will have dedicated desktops. Like right now, I have nine of them open. Okay. Um, so this plus eight others for different clients. And like it might be that client's logo is the actual artwork of the desktop surface. So I can quickly see it. Oh, you know, I get a call from someone. I just switch and there they are. And I might have like 100 windows open right now. 50 different word documents on different things and but it's very clear and, and it's uncluttered i can work through it i can make the mac work for me i probably could do it on windows if i knew windows but it's just a lot of window management and just moving stuff around keeping stuff clean using things like i have a there's a feature right now I, i'm in do not disturb mode for the duration of this call so i'm not going to get little email notices you're not going to hear pings or dings or see me getting distracted so little tricks like that which i've learned the hard way <laughs> um so, yeah, I'm, and I'm always, always trying to come up with new ways to do stuff and or just hone it, hone it, hone it, because I don't get paid to do my own admin work, right? That's unpaid work. That's the cost of doing business. So if I can do that in, in an hour versus eight hours, 
my my margins go way up. Yeah, I, I th- you mentioned hard, and that kind of brings me to a question about like just overall, just like running your business. And it seems like you 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 already had this experience, so you already had this skill built up, and you kind of you already had experience of jobs. So there's the jobs aspect where you're used to providing a service for a client and making them happy. But like, what what has been like if if it wasn't any of those two, what has been like the hardest thing? Um, for you to keep your business successful over these years? Was it just like making clients happy over and over again? Or like, what would you say is the biggest um, difficulty or the biggest thing that you should stress for someone starting a business like yourself um, to be successful? That's a great question. Um, I think, I mean, there's different exigencies I've weathered throughout the years. Economy's gone up, economy's gone down, clients have come, clients have gone you know, there's trends and all that stuff. But there is one constant, and I think this is important. It's a cliche, but it's true. And in my business, you're only as good as the last thing you've done. If I turn out something crappy, that client goes away. They are under no obligation to hire me again. I'm not somebody's kid. <laughs> there's no nepotism involved here. I don't have some locked-in contract. I'm not, I'm not even on salary. I'm a 1099. I'm a freelancer. And... um so, and I think that's great. I think it's fantastic. It motivates me to do my best, best work every time on everything I do. I'm putting my name on that, okay? And I want them to go, wow, this is awesome. What can we hire Ken for next? Okay, and that's the constant, constant challenge. Um, if you mess up, you don't, who's going to give you a second chance? Well, I wouldn't. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's capitalism. It's brutal. Um, and it should be, it's great. I love it. It's a great system. So, um, so I think that's it because I keep clients a long time. I keep clients for years and years and years. Generally they're happy with what I do. And then, and then they find out, Oh, you can do this. Oh, great. Well, great. Oh, you can do this. Yeah. You can direct other people, other creatives. Yeah, of course I did that. Fine. Handle parts of our team. One of my clients, they like titles. I'm their fractional chief marketing officer. So, so anyway, I think that would be my advice to to your audience is just do great work. Put kill it. Hit it out of the park. That's that's how you'll differentiate yourself. And if it's something that you love doing, as we discussed earlier, and it pushes your own buttons, gets you excited, makes you happy, you'll do you'll do good stuff and uh and it'll keep coming at you. There's a there's a little bit of zen in that, a little bit of karma. It'll come back at you. That's awesome. You're really giving us a lot of advice, especially for young people. So I appreciate that. Um, I think you kind of mentioned how you do target clients that kind of are a fit for you and that you would be happy with and you think you can benefit. But is there anything else that you really look for when maybe vetting clients or trying to decide if a client may be a bad fit or a good fit for um, how you can service them? And there may there might not be any additional answer to that, but yeah, you can kind of tell. I mean, God, experience is the greatest thing. I mean, it sucks getting old, but it sucks being young in terms of like, you don't have any. You know, it's like me. Like, you're not going to get credit for that car. Why not? Because you don't have credit. We won't give you credit. You don't have credit. It's like, what the heck? <laughs> you know? So, um, so in terms of like, is it a good fit or not? At this point, pretty easy for me to tell. I mean, nobody just like sends me an email saying, here, Ken, write this. There's always going to be an initial conversation, a call. I'm going to say, hey, send me the stuff you've got, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to look at what they've got. And I'm going to talk to them. And, you know, I've got a pretty sensitive BS meter, for example. You know, I can tell. You just, you get a feel for these things. And um, and and, by, and the opposite is true, too. It's like, talk to someone, it's like, oh, I know what you do. Oh, that's really cool. I'd love to learn more about what you guys do. That sounds exciting. You're pushing my geek button. I would love to learn more about this stuff and write about it for you and create do creative campaigns on it and um and you just kind of get along with people so there's a very personal uh aspect to it which is really important you know it's like you're going to work with this person you want to have fun and get along with them um you don't if you don't feel it early you know i mean i've been wrong but the older i get the less i am in terms of that just because you kind of know you get a you get a feel, you know, people say, hey, have you ever written something for robotic process automation? Yeah, hundreds. You can't stump me. You know, it's just, there's so much stuff I've done 
you know, and there's stuff I haven't done. There's, I mean, it's not like I've done everything. There are verticals I don't serve or stuff. I don't do retail, for example. I did that at the ad agency. Been there, done that. Don't do it anymore. Um, so you get a feel for it. You get a feel for it. And, and even now, not to say like, oh, you're babes in the woods. So you have no idea if you talk to somebody who's a complete jerk that you won't figure them out. You'll figure them out. You're smart. Um, but use that kind of spidey sense to your advantage. Yeah, I, th- I think that point, you just just like going to get credit at the bank and you're like, can I get some credit? And they're like, no, you, that, that, it just kind of like summarizes like a big lesson on life is like you can't wait around like letting other people control what you want to do in life. And like if you want to go, if you want to get credit and you want to be successful and you want to have money, then you have to make steps to go get that money, whether it be something like experience at a job or simply a credit score, because you can't sit around and if you want to go help a client and you're like, oh, I don't have any experience, but I want you to give me the experience. Like if you don't make that first initial conversation with someone as, as a uh, as a business or a, as a freelancer, then you're not going to get any experience in general and you're going to be chasing this this idea of selling stuff your whole life. Well, you need to take the initiative. I mean, I did with that story with the letter, but I have a, a much more recent example. I've got a client that specializes in um, IT for M&A, mergers and acquisitions. Okay, that's what they specialize in. And they have this huge track record of doing what's called PMI, post-merger integration. So big enterprise buys up a company. And now all their systems have to talk to each other, the computers, their email, all the zillions of stuff. So this client of mine that I help do the marketing for, they've done all this experience doing PMI, PMI, post-merger integration. And what they've seen is, gosh, look at all these things that don't work, that don't fix each other. Okay. And but there's a whole other side of the industry they wanted to get into. It's not post-merger integration, but basically pre-merger, what's called the due diligence. Okay, before that big enterprise goes to buy that company, they're scoping it out. And is it worth it? Blah, blah, blah. And they realize like, that's a really lucrative sector. They want to get into that. And they had no experience. Right. I helped them write a letter. In fact, I ghost wrote it for them where I said, dear, and like, we're going after PE firms, private equity firms. And they're the ones that are helping to make these deals happen. Hi, I'm so and so. I'm the leader of this company. And, um, we spent the last X years doing X billion dollars worth of PMI activity, post-merger integration activity. And by doing all this, we have seen all every single mistake that has been committed during due diligence by teams that supposedly have this under control, but don't, and have ended up costing the deal time and money from, from announcement day. Okay. I would like to talk to you because I think given our experience, we could help you on the due diligence side. Okay. We have never done it, totally honest, but boy, have we, we've been doing cleanup of all this crap from all the mistakes that others have made. So we think we can do it. Sent out a bunch of these letters, got one hit on it, got a nibble, and that was all we needed. Got a foot in the door, and now this company of mine, they do it equally. They're doing pre and post. And it was the same thing as going to the bank and writing a letter. Same thing, except on the billion dollar scale. Okay, and just sending out emails, putting them out through LinkedIn and stuff like that. Got one nibble, it's all it took. And then, then we say, oh yeah, we've done, pre- we've done due diligence and you've done it. Oh yeah, I have credit, I bought a car and you've done it. But you take that, you seize the initiative, you find that way in. Yeah, so, yeah it can be done. I think that's the perfect example of that. Um, I know you, you've kind of, on your site, you, it shows kind of what you guys have worked or what you have worked on. And it seems like you've done just about everything. But one thing that really stuck out to me is commercials. Um, Cause like, I feel like my whole childhood is just embodied by commercials. Cause as a child, like I was always watching TV and just the commercials. I don't even know. They just always stuck out to me. The tricks ones. Those ones. I would never forget the tricks commercials. Those are crazy. <laughs> um, but I was curious, like what does the process for um, creating a commercial look like? And maybe what stages of that did you handle when you were um, creating a commercial for a client? Oh, I've done them all, you know, all that stuff. There's, I mean, it's it's fairly straightforward, even with the new digital technologies. I mean, the, the creative throughput is still the same. You've got to figure out, take a take a customer back approach. Who are you selling to, and what is their needs? Okay, and then you deal with the, the your client. What are we selling? What are we trying to make? What product or service? Okay, and then you okay, then you have the uh, you'll get like the creative brief if you're in an agency situation in terms of. You've got certain brand guidelines that we need to adhere to and certain look and feel that we want to do. So you're, you've already got some guide rails. And then from that, then you start developing uh, script concepts. You write a script, try to get that approved. 
that goes through your vision. So I've done all this stuff, you know, writing the scripts. I've, I've drawn the storyboards. I'll do it out. I've direct, you know, I've done worked on the casting or bringing in actors and models and all that stuff and having them read. And then, um, you know, directing, I've done that, you know, on location, either video and film I've actually shot and um, directing all the talent and then going into post where you put it all together, you edit it together. And I mean, commercials, very tight. You got to get to the frame. You know, you've only got a 30 second spot uh, where these days, 15 or 10. I mean, they keep getting shorter. And um, so it's it's compartmentalized and it depends on the budget in terms of how many people you can staff. Right. So like what I was just telling you, I wore a heck of a lot of hats back in the day. Those were low budget commercials. So of course, I'm not going to hire, you know, I would hire like hair and makeup person. To, to, to work with the talent because I'm not, I can't do that. I'm not going to, <laughs> I don't know how. Right. But in terms of, you know, other stuff, you know, it's like, okay, well, yeah, I'm not going to hire a storyboard artist because I can draw, you know, it's cheaper. I'm already on salary. We'll do it. And, uh, so, you know, and then, uh, as you start putting the pieces together, that's when the commercial starts to look like a commercial and it starts to get slick. So in terms of, oh, for example, we do jingles. So I did lots and lots of jingles. It sucks. Jingles kind of went away. They just kind of went away. They What's, should come back. What I was that Band-Aid jingle? Did you do that Band-Aid jingle? You remember that? No. Do you know who wrote, like the, stuck you know who wrote the Band-Aid there? jingle? Who was that? Do you know who wrote that? Barry Manilow. Oh. Barry Manilow is like the huge platinum uh, recording artist. Okay. He was a jingle artist before he became he went mainstream. He wow. wrote that jingle. I'm stuck on Band-Aid, but Band-Aid stuck on me. That's a famous one. Um, so... But I wouldn't write the music. I'd write the lyrics. And I worked with like great composers. Or sometimes we'd take library music and we'd write lyrics to that. But I was the guy who had to go into the client meeting and sing with like a boom box. Okay, to get approval on the lyrics. And I can't sing, you know, but I'd have to go in there and hit it, you know. So, but, you know, I can do, you know, I can do jingle lyrics. I do product, you know, product names, you know, have names, you know, product names, service names, all that kind of stuff, you know. I've done the glamorous side of it, if you call it that. I don't know. <laughs> Directing the models and, you know, photo shoots and all that stuff. So yeah, it's, you know, it's part of the job. That's awesome. Um, I'm curious, just like transitioning, like just in, into writing in general. Um, I'm sure you've wrote probably hours, probably at least thousands of hours just writing. And I think um, at least personally, I, there's so much value, I think, in writing and and how, how it's different than actually just like even speaking to someone. And it's really like, okay, you're writing something down. You, you go back through it and be like, does this thought make sense? So can you relate to that at all? And like, how is writing um, kind of changed the way, whether it be in business or even like your personal life, just writing or journaling or anything like that? How has that changed your life for the better? If it has. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good skill. I've, you know, way back, I used to, I taught college for a short time. I taught introductory and advanced filmmaking at a community college in New York. And um, I would assign papers. And I remember, you know, putting in the instructions, you know, you're going to have to write for this. And so it's just, and it's a good skill wherever you are. You can be a computer programmer. And if you can't write a good email, your career is at a dead end. Right? You know, so it's a good skill to have. Um, I think for people who are intimidated by it, think of it as talking. It really is. And when we read, we all sub vocalize. You read something and you hear your own voice saying it. And that's why New Yorkers read faster than people in the South. They talk faster. So it's the same thing. So it makes it easier. The nice thing is exactly what you said, Kyle, is that you can go back and polish it. If I say something stupid right now, it's, it's too late. It's out there. I said it. you know. But if I write it down, I can read it back. It's like, oh, wait, let me move that. Let me do that. And to me, that's fun. Because then it start, it gets better and better. You work it, you work it. And uh, I mean, just this morning, I was working on a, a project, a direct response campaign. And there were all these cooks at this client. Everybody's, well, let's add this, let's add this. And it was like a cover note. It's going out physically, getting mailed. It's a huge thing. It's a very expensive thing that's going out. It's about all I can say. And um, everybody had, and this thing just, it turned into Wikipedia. It was just ridiculous. And finally, the... Uh, the owner of this this consultancy said, "Man, this thing's looking long. I, you know, it's making my eyes glaze over." And I just wrote back. I said, "Music to my ears," and I just chop the thing, cut it. You've heard less is more. Woo! Is it ever? And I cut this thing down. I cut it down to its barest essentials, and 
everybody on this email chain, it's all through email, they all flip this, oh my God, this is great, it's beautiful, it's perfect, love it. And it was the fun of polishing and just realizing all the stuff that you were taught in elementary school. What is dead wood? What is redundancy? It's saying we have a patented process here and here and here. Well, don't say it three times. Save it for, that's probably the sexiest thing. So I'm going to save it for the end. Da, 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 da. Oh, and by the way, it's patented. right? And you can kind of have a little dramatic pause and build to that. So it's a good skill. And uh, also throughout my life, when I deal with like bureaucracies, I remember I had problems with the cable company once when I was younger. And they said, you know, I had to file a complaint because the cable went out. And they said, you know, you're going to have to put this in writing. I'm like, ooh, I'm scared. You know, it's like, you're not going to scare me. They, they try and intimidate you. You're going to have to put this in writing. I'm a writer. It doesn't phase me in the least, you know. So, uh, so it's a good skill to have. It's always useful. Um, and it's, you know, and to get paid for it, it's gravy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, just quick question. Like, how do you think, I think creativity is kind of like this, it's kind of this abstract term and the practice of it is abstract in itself because you kind of have to find thing, put a bunch of either put a bunch of things together and kind of come up with something that you didn't see or kind of create something that isn't there already. So what would you say like to, for anyone that's trying to improve their creativity or, or maybe they're like, wow, I'm not the creative person. How do I improve my creativity? If it really is just like coming up with these aha moments. It's a great question. I got a couple answers to that and a story, which, which I think will kind of bring us full circle here. Um, in terms of creativity, I had a college professor who said, when you're a writer, you write, you write, you write. My friends and I would always look at each other because when he had a big point, he'd say it in threes. Okay. But it's true. All right. You don't think about it. You just do it. Get out there and do it. So that's in terms of, you know, people have asked me, oh, do you ever have writer's block? Given it, it's like, no, never. That's a joke. What if writer's block or anything? You just it means you gotta, you gotta work harder. Okay. So you can always crank it. You can always work. You can always beat yourself up more. I mean, there's little tricks. Go look on the blogs on copalcommunications.com. I have a whole category every two weeks for like the past seven years. I've been posting things like buy a diver's slate. Go on Amazon, a diver's slate, like what scuba divers use. Hang it in your shower. I get the best ideas in the shower because there's no distractions. Oh, what was that? Oh, I come up with a hundred taglines in the shower. And I got to write them down because I forget after the first one. So, so I've got blogs that you can all about getting inspiration, how to find it, how to get it, inspiration from nature and all of that kind of stuff. And then the last part, there's a little story I wanted to tell you guys, because I think you'll like this because it's, it's right when I was your age and it, and it kind of encapsulates everything we've been talking about. When I was in college, I declared as an English major. Okay, I think with like by, by your second year, you have to declare your major or something like that. So I declared as, a, you know, I had taken some introductory courses and it was the fall semester. And it was the first day of my first upper division English class. And I was totally scared and intimidated. Okay, I walk in, right? And plus, I always look young, so I look like I'm 12. And I walk into this and I sit down and it's all the upper class and the juniors and the seniors and the guys have little goatees and they're wearing tweed jackets with the patches on the elbows and the girls are carrying little starbucks coffees and oh my god i'm like what am i doing here i'm really really nervous and the professor comes out before the class it's the first day of class and he says you know on the first day of class most professors just go over the course requirements and the syllabus he says you know what i'm going to do that on the second day of class the first day of class i like to get to know you my students he's got a stack of papers he said, everybody take one. And he passes them out, take one, pass it back. And it's a poem. He said, take a few minutes, read the poem, and we're going to discuss it. And I'll get to know you. Okay. So I look at this poem. And it's all about the ptarmigan. The ptarmigan did this, the ptarmigan did that. My love is like a ptarmigan. So after a few minutes, everybody's done. And I'm like sweating. And he says, who in the class who in the class would like to uh, weigh in on, on this this poem? And a guy raises his hand. Hi. Oh, and the, the professor says, yes, Mr. Jones, what do you think? Mr. You know, this guy stands up and he says, to me, the ptarmigan represents a hemiplegic, indeed epiphenomenal deconstruction of the inherent antagonism between the pre-classical thesis and the postmodern antithesis. 
It's clearly a didactic, albeit quixotic metaphor for the intersection of scientific determinism and dialectical materialism. And I'm like, oh my God. And the professor's like, anyone else? And this girl raises her head. Miss Smith she goes, yes. And this girl stands up and she goes, I think the ptarmigan epitomizes humanity's growing disillusionment and rejection of bourgeoisie values and the struggle to find meaning amid an increasingly commercialized society. It obviously prefigures an Orwellian dystopia. And one after another, after another, after another, one's smarter than the other. I'm like, oh my, and I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm just like drenched in sweat. It's like, I am the stupidest kid in this class. Oh my God. This is true. I'm not making up a word of this story. Okay. So finally, it goes around. Everybody's got this thing. And finally, I can't take it. I raise my hand. The professor calls on me. He says, yes, Mr. Copel. I said, Hi. I said, uh, I got to tell you, um, I don't have a dictionary with me today. What's a ptarmigan? <laughs> and he laughs. And he goes, that's a great question. He goes, perhaps somebody here in the class can tell Mr. Copel what a ptarmigan is. And just like that, everybody looks down at their desk. None of them knew what a ptarmigan is. None of them. I went from being the stupidest kid in the class to not really, and all of these geniuses plummeted from grace. Okay, so the takeaway here is don't be afraid of your ignorance, ask questions, be curious, it's your best ammunition. And by the way, a ptarmigan is a bird. Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's an awesome story. And I think at the beginning of the podcast, you kind of mentioned um, not or being true to yourself, and that's like sort of plays into that story because you know you didn't pretend to understand something that you didn't um raise your hand i'm totally ignorant i don't know what does that mean exactly I do it all the time i'm in big important meetings with the big important people what's that word mean i don't understand and it's like i'm not gonna pretend i know it if i don't and of course it means everybody else doesn't know it either right so yeah absolutely ask what the freaking ptarmigan is <laughs> That's a super valuable skill. Um, sort of as we start to wrap up here, we um, we have a question that we ask every single one of our guests, um, and that is, what is one goal you have in your career or personal life, and what actions are you taking to achieve it? Hmm. It's going to sound mundane, but I think it's to do good work. I really, I, I, um, I mentioned to you that creative professional is an oxymoron. Okay. I am one. So I'm able to kind of bridge that divide, but it's very hard. And it was one of the hardest things for me to do professionally because as a creative person, I'm naturally thin skinned. What do you mean? You don't like it. I'm going to go cry. Okay. And, um, so now I'll hand in something people, you know, the, I'll get the feedback. Well, this really sucks. Here's a hundred ways that we hate it. And I say, Thanks for the feedback. Let me work on version two. Okay. But I'm still the same guy. It's like, I'm still like, God. Okay. So I still have that innate desire to please. I want to please. I want people to like me. I want people to like my work. I want people to like me through my work. Okay. So it's kind of, it's an ongoing thing. If you talk to any creative, they're going to get it, what I'm saying. It's a little bit like a drug and you got to get your fix of it. Somebody complimented me this morning. That lasts about a half hour. But, you know, it's like, now I got to do something good. I got to do something really good to, you know, prove myself again and keep doing it. And I mean, there's a good side to it because it keeps me doing good stuff. Um, there's a similar vein here to performers and athletes. And I know this from having directed other creative people. They kind of want, if they're good at it, even though they're shy and they're thin-skinned, they still want to show off. They're better at Photoshop than anybody else. And they can make that filter work and do something, you know, that somebody else couldn't do. They want to show it off. And so there's always that drive, if you're in my field, in creative services, to just try and do something new, something better to, you know, I mean, when I was in the agency biz, you know, there would be award season. We'd apply for all the awards and all this stuff. And you go up and you get a statuette or whatever. Um, 
but just I don't I'm not in that doing that stuff these days but it's it's still to be able to sleep at night saying I did good stuff I delivered value my client if I charge my client a hundred bucks for something I hope they got five hundred dollars worth of value out of it I hope they like it I've worked on projects where I've I was helping uh, I've done some books for example I've ghost copy edited some books and I know that like the author was like showing his wife that chapter hey look at this this is really cool and that's great you know I love stuff like that so just little things like that so even though I've kind of buttoned down the professional side of it and I built can act very responsibly and professionally that part of it that neediness <laughs> never goes away and uh and so it constantly motivates that, that's awesome i think i hope that answers your question yeah it does I, I think doing good work is is a lot easier said than done and it seems like you have the proven track record of of doing it these past years and and i hope you still continue to do it um you mentioned the blogs on the website, so we would definitely link your website um, below. But this is also just a chance, like, if you want to leave any, like, books or if you have any people or videos or websites that you just want to leave with the audience, maybe um, specifically on creativity and how to really access more creativity in your life or just in general on success or life. Yeah, I can get, I'll give you a couple things. Yeah, if, if somebody's looking to find creative inspiration and tricks to do stuff and uh, counterintuitive tips, things like that, I got tons of them. I just everything I've learned, the best stuff I know, I give it away for free. In the blog so just scroll through them you'll look at the top oh that looks cool that's interesting okay so that's good and then just in terms of tools just basic tools like i mentioned for example a diver's slate which you probably wouldn't think of what does a writer carry a diver's slate works in the shower what it's like no you get really great stuff and so i was just looking like on my book sh bookshelf right here some of the stuff i have are tools that i use so for example uh there's a website called rhyme zone like rhyming rhyme zone and you could just type in a, any word and it spits out every word that rhymes with it. It's an online rhyming dictionary. It's incredibly useful. I use it all the time. Okay. Sometimes a headline just wants to have kind of a cadence to it. It's like, okay, see what rhymes. And sometimes you'll see something really funny comes up you don't expect. You know, I did something about litigation anticipation, right, for a certain client. And I'm looking up all the things that rhyme with that anticipation. One of the words that came up was constipation. Oh my God, that's funny as hell. And I used it in the copy and the client said it was the best thing I ever wrote. Okay. <laughs> I was able to weave it in. It wasn't just like throw it in, but rhyme zone, um, online dictionary, every computer's got one. So you can do a keyword search and you look up like one word and just see all the words that come up in the word list and you'll get ideas from that. You'll see related words. Um, I've got a, 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 a slang thesaurus. That's really useful. That stuff probably is online these days a slang thesaurus because it's not a regular regular word it's the slang words i mean you go both you know what's the slang word for let's say money oh yeah bucks cabbage dough but like there's better ones than that okay if you want to have fun sometime just be silly pick up one of these and look up a dirty word and you will laugh your butt off because it'll go for, that's where the biggest sex page after page after page for some body part sexual thing or whatever it's really just something to do um i keep a baby name book um for naming characters sometimes you have to do that so i've got you know for new parents buy a baby name book twenty one thousand twenty thousand names for baby i keep that that's a good reference um i keep a concise english handbook here sometimes i have to look up grammar stuff uh copy the ap style guide um for the associated press i don't use it that much it's dense it's really thick I don't use it that much because it's mostly for press releases, which I don't do too much of these days. Um, but those are some of the, you know, the tools that are out there. The web is amazing. You just look up stuff. You just get ridiculous instant gratification. It's insane. So those are some of the things, you know, some of them are obvious, some of them not so obvious. I hope that helps. Yes, it does. Um, and the whole conversation today really helped. And I learned a lot too. And I hope the, the listeners did as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful having you. Ken. Oh, that was great. Thanks for having me. Uh, you guys are great hosts. You're doing a great show and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it.